Oh, I'm recording. Ah, sorry. So rude. I didn't even greet y'all. I was still setting it. I was daydreaming. I just absolutely positively thinking about something else. Personal in my life wasn't even about the Bible study, nothing. So, all right, let's get to it. Sometimes I'm clicking away and don't realize what I've done. Welcome, everybody. I love you. Good morning. Good afternoon. <laughs> All right. So let's continue on in Romans. And by the way, this uh, column, second column of my dad's King James, uh, does end the chapter. It's a clean break. Not only the end of a verse, because usually the verse will move over, you know, will carry over to the next page or the next column. But uh, it also... Um, is the end of chapter four. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which had not as though they were. I wanted to read how this read in the King James. That is written, I have made thee the father of many nations before whom he believed. Even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as they were. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would, remember, I use that word hope a lot. I don't know I'm a sheep. I'm in hope of being a sheep. So um, you never know for sure. If you knew for sure, then what's stopping you? from going out and doing what you want to do when you want to do it. Whoops. But I know I'm safe, so it doesn't really matter. Right? You don't know for sure. True sheep never truly know they're saved, even though Christ in them gives them that blessed hope. But it's a constant struggle of the flesh that never stops sinning, but will stop sinning, of course, the deadly sins spoken of, for instance, in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. But you never quite get rid of that sense of self, ego, pride, flesh, uh, to lesser degrees of the Galatians 5, 19 through 21 sins, um, like adultery, fornication, wrath, strife, libatiousness, drunkenness, revelry. Um, and then it ends with those that do such things shall not inherit the kingdom. So, but you never get rid of the lesser sins, but they're sins nonetheless. Let's just put it like that. That do still involve your pride, your ego, your sense of self. Um, you know, just trying to be appealing to people, trying to be appealing to the opposite sex, just trying to, trying, 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 trying. What are you trying? You're trying to show off who you are, even if it's in the slightest ways. It's just what you do. And so you never, you never get rid of that. Like, we're, like when y'all see that in me, in person or on social media, or even in my YouTube videos, or even in my Bible studies. That's not who I'm going to be when I'm with the Lord. That's me perfected. That's me no longer sinning. That's not the way we are now. But you will repent of the certain sins that the law speaks to, or his word speaks to. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, and in other places in the New Testament, there's lists. 
So even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations because God had told him that, right? That's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, his faith grew stronger, and in he brought God to glory. He was fully convinced that God was able to do whatever he promises. And because of Abraham's faith, I don't forget, Abraham did sleep with um, oh, Hagar. And brought forth um, that branch of the Arab type world, and where Sarah brought forth the nation of David, the Jews, Moses, that was the lineage for Christ, the bloodline. And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit. It was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous. If we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus, our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins and was raised to life to make us right with God. Being not weak in the faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet uh, deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in the faith, giving uh, glory to God. So you don't get the story of Abraham and Hagar there. And if you ever want to read that, the story of Hagar in the Old Testament. Genesis 16, 1 through 16. Genesis 21, 8 through 21. Genesis 16. Go to Got Questions. It was Sarah, Abraham's wife, that brought Hagar to him saying, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. So Abraham did, as she said, and Hagar became pregnant. Despite the fact that this adulterous situation was her own doing, Sarah became jealous when the younger fertile slave girl began to flaunt her expanding waistline. Genesis 16, 4, in anger, Sarah started treating Hagar harshly, causing Hagar to run away in the desert, verses 5 and 6. The angel of the Lord found her and comforted her, telling her to return to her mistress and giving her a prophecy concerning her son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery, and he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. He will live in hostility towards all of his brothers. This was Hagar's first encounter with Abraham's God, and she called him the God who sees me. So apparently Hagar was a sheep. Later, Hagar bore the son to Abram and named him Ishmael. The Lord told her, uh, as the Lord told her to do, Hagar's story resumes 14 years later. When Isaac was born to Abraham, and Sarah. So Sarah gave birth 14 years later, shortly after Isaac was weaned. Sarah saw Ishmael taunting him and took the matter to Abraham. Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share the inheritance with my son Isaac. Although it grieved Abraham to do so, he gave Hagar and Ishmael some provisions and sent them away. And Ishmael and his mother wandered in the desert. Well, so much for the man being head of household. <laughs> right? I mean, uh, very interesting stories there. When Hagar's food and water ran out, uh, she did not know what to do. She put Ishmael under a bush for shade 
and then went a few paces away so she would not have to watch him die. As Hagar wept, the Lord called to her from heaven with the words of comfort. God gave them her promise. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand. I will make him a great nation. The Bible says, opened her eyes and saw a well of water that she had not seen in her distress. God rescued Hagar and gave her hope and direction. God was with Ishmael as he grew up in the desert. Abraham's sin with Hagar has resulted in centuries sorrow and bloodshed as descendants of Isaac, um, the Jews, and Ishmael, the Arabs, have been mortal enemies ever since. Uh, the Apostle Paul used the story of Hagar and Sarah to teach spiritual truth concerning our salvation in Galatians 4. As Hagar represents the old covenant based on the law, that's kind of what we're reading in Romans uh, 4. And do you think they made a typo there? No, it says Galatians 4, 431. So brothers are not the children of the slave, but of the free. Okay. So as a coincidence, another chapter four. Um, I'm using the Hagar thing. With, um, it just, you know, since we're talking about Abraham, I thought to bring up the whole Hagar story because it talked about how strong uh, Abraham's faith was, but obviously his faith wasn't that strong because he let Sarah talk him into having sex with Hagar, not trusting that God would do as he said and bring forth uh, Sarah's pregnancy. So anyway, let's move on to Daniel. Did we finish 25? Who's delivered up from our offenses and raised again for our justification. Yes. And that is how you're justified through what Christ did on the cross but then we go through a justification, sanctification process as we nail ourselves, or the, or the Lord does it, of course, but we nail our flesh to the cross. And so um, we go through that. That's when we die to self. It's called the daily cross, the blood baptism, uh, the fiery trials. All right. And for the magistracy that he gave him, all people, nations and languages trembled and feared. Oh, okay. He's telling the story. This is Daniel telling the story of uh, Belshazzar's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel is called Belteshazzar. So Belteshazzar, Daniel, is telling Belshazzar without the te, um, a story about his grandfather. And for the majesty that he gave him, Nebuchadnezzar, all the people and nations and languages trembled and feared before him, your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, whom he would slew. When he what? chopped him down like a tree, but left the roots and made him live like the beasts of the field and wet with the dew of heaven every morning. Nails growing long, hair growing long, eating grass. So that's quite the, um, yeah. And whom he would, he put down. So let me read that again. Whom he would slew, Nebuchadnezzar, your grandfather, and, but whom he did keep alive and whom he would set up and whom he would put down. So Paul's just, I mean, uh, Daniel's explaining that process. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was disposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen 
and his body was wet with it. I didn't realize they were going to explain all this or I wouldn't have stopped the study and talked about it. So sorry about that. Wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the most high God ruled till he knew it, till he knew it, till he knew. Well, see, he finally got the free will decision to finally know. No, God beat the world out of him and God gave him the wisdom. This, that's the whole chastening and scourging process. Hebrews 12, 6 through 8, King James Version, Bible Gateway. Till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, that he appointeth over it whomsoever he will. God's in charge of everything. There's no free will taking place by man to be the Antichrist, to be Judas, to be Pharaoh, to be Nero, throwing the Christians to the lions, or to be Abraham, or to be Saul who becomes Paul, or to be John. You're born that way. For whom the Lord loveth, like Nebuchadnezzar, he will lock you down and beat. And when you're enduring it, God is dealing with you as a father does to a son. But if you be without it, in other words, if the Lord never does pull you out of the world, and lock you down and beat the world out of you, then you're a bastard and you're not a son. That's just cold, hard, plain facts, man. Nobody wants to hear it. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, grandson, and thou his grandson, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart. Well, we read earlier how father was actually grandfather. Well, remember we did that whole Bible study look up? Well, let's look up the word son, because that should also um, give us a clue. Because remember that word for father really came to, um, oh, what was it? What was that key word? Oh, can't remember. Son, just says son, but it was his grandson. It's so weird. Remember we did that study and it went all about how, and then we, then we looked up the history of it and he was the grandson. And the word doesn't actually mean father. It means, um, which we now have to go back and do to prove it to somebody who maybe didn't see it so they won't think we're crazy. What does it say, the word father? Well, let's just look up. Daniel 5. We'll find it ourselves. His father, Nebuchadnezzar. H2, like H2O. Well, that just says father. That's a different word than what we looked up the other day. Because remember when we looked it all up in the in the New Living, it gave the definition like anointed one. 
not anointed one, but what was it? Well, now they really got us going on a on a on a goose chase, huh? Predecessor didn't say father at all. So five two, which is what we just pulled up, right? Wasn't that five two? Yeah. I guess what we did is we looked up the history and it said grandfather, and then we looked it up in the translations and it said predecessor, but I never did look it up. Whoops, I'm cooking. I'm hearing something I shouldn't hear. All right, hang on. Oh, is that the Lord coming back and telling us that we taught it wrongly, that maybe it is his real son? And we shouldn't go by what the history says because they alter history, sometimes go against the Bible and can't trust the New Living Translation. So I don't know. We looked up father. We looked up son. It just said father. It just said son. Mm. And, you know, how long did Daniel live? So we're, going to, we're just going to say father and son instead of grandfather. Uh, just to be on the safe side, knowing that it could be grandfather and grandson, maybe. I don't know, but that's not what it says. Uh, that is not what it says. <clears throat> but remember, these Strong's concordances have been watered down. They're not always correct. They do a rotten job with words like baptism, which means to cover with a stain or a dye. Um, now it's used as a verb, uh, like dunking water. And when you look it up, that's basically what it's telling you and which doesn't give you anything as far as Jesus saying um, or John the Baptist saying one will come after me baptizing you with the Holy Spirit and fire what does that have to do with water I mean um, And he baptized you with water into repentance, but he that come after me is mightier than I, and whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So let's look up baptism. Let's look up that one, G907. G907, they're both the same word. So now you're being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And what does it give you for a definition? To dip repeatedly or to immerse or to submerge. <laughs> so the Holy Spirit immerses into you. To cleanse by dipping or submerging. To wash, to make clean with water. To wash oneself, bathe, to overwhelm. Well, you're going to have to look at that word overwhelm. That you're being, or that word immerse, you're being immersed with the Holy Spirit. It is overwhelming your body. It is calling you. You saw what happened to Saul on the road to Damascus. He was uh, overwhelmed by God's calling the Holy Spirit. He got the baptism. Um, that's as good a job as they did. That's a, that's a horrible definition that they gave you here at Blue, Blue Letter Bible. It's a horrible definition. So a lot of their definitions are watered down, so... We're not going to be dogmatic about son, grandson, um, father, grandfather. We're going to leave that a gray area. So basically what he's saying was he's telling the story that we've just got through reading. Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar wrote Daniel chapter 4. All that we've uh, covered so far is Daniel retelling that story to Nebuchadnezzar's son slash grandson, Belshazzar. But when his heart... And then his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart. Thou, though, knewest all this, so in other words, you knew the story of your dad slash granddad. You knew the story. 
of how he was humbled and called by the Lord, yet you haven't done it. But you've lifted yourself up against the creator of all things, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they have brought the vessels of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's house from Israel before thee, you know, the cups of gold and wine, and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines and have drunk wine in them, these gold and silver cups from that they captured, that they received when they captured Israel and brought them into captivity. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and of brass and of iron and wood and stone, which see not nor hear not nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose are always thy ways, has thou not glorified? In other words, you haven't glorified the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the creator of all things. Not one bit you have. Then was the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written. So now he's about to make the interpretation. We'll get to that tomorrow. All right, love y'all very much.